Hey everybody, what's up? Just waiting on some folks to join in. Um, but just saying hello. Hello everyone. Happy Thursday. It's Thursday, right? Yeah, it's Thursday. Hey everybody. Just saying what's up. Um, and I figured, you know, it's been uh, a minute since we've been able to catch up. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned in my IG story a little earlier today, you know, I'm sorry if I've been a little MIA, uh, was dealing with a little bit of a health issue that kind of had me sidelined for a little bit. Don't worry, I'm totally fine. Um, you know, just life happens sometimes. So, um, but I'm back and of course, like the one to two weeks that I was sidelined, it was like the whole everything kind of got set on fire. Um, <laughs> and there's just been a huge amount of public events from the Supreme Court, from um, Shireen Abu Akleh, the Palestinian journalist that was um, killed, to uh, the Buffalo shooting, um, New York redistricting. I mean, it's just been wild. And so I figured we have a lot to talk about um, as well as um, as well as I figured I'd add uh, a fundraiser here for National Abortion Funds, uh, which is a national network of, of several different individual abortion funds that help facilitate um, people being able to access their uh, their ability and their right to health care. And, um, you know, it is so awful that we're in this moment. Um, but right now, I really think that one of the most effective things that we can do is to help people whose rights are being attacked right now access the health care and the abortion care that they need. Um, the Supreme Court has long been radicalized and and you have basically a several people uh that have lied <laughs> i don't know if we're able i don't know if uh i mean it certainly feels like uh they they absolutely misled um we'll say that according to some senators misled in their statements uh, misled them in their statements uh, in order to get on the Supreme Court. And now that they're on the Supreme Court, they're ruling the way that they're ruling. But this is a radicalized Supreme Court uh, where several justices were appointed by a man who facilitated in insurrection against the United States government. And they, you know, that's clearly being reflected in, in the decisions coming out in the court. In the court. Um, but anyways, I figured one of the best things that we can do right now is directly assist people who need abortions in places where they can't uh, get them or where they are being deeply marginalized, stigmatized, prevented from getting them. So, you know, whether that's financially, you can do that right here uh, while I'm chatting about and catching up with you all, or it could be logistically. Um, and I just want, anyone who's hopping on here to know that if you are in any place that is outlawing abortion, that is trying to prevent you from accessing it, uh, whether it's Texas, Oklahoma, or any other place, uh, you are welcome in New York. And we will do what we can um, to welcome you. We have taken actions on a state level, uh, in, including opening up abortion funds to help people get the, the transportation uh, needed to get here. Um, and I also know that there's just an enormous amount of organizing efforts that are launching to, for people to open their homes uh, to people who are seeking an abortion or needing that care. And it just never stops you know, just shocking me, the amount of ignorance that goes into this. I mean, people think, even when people talk about quote unquote late abortions, people have no idea what goes into that, the heartbreak of that. People who are getting an abortion or what is technically an abortion in 
you know, your late second, tri your late second trimester or your third trimester, that is not done out of some sort of elected, you know, something that you want to do. Um, I have friends that were so excited to have a child and a horrifying complication um, came up late into pregnancy um, that required a DNC. And it is one of the most traumatizing, horrifying things to happen to a family, um, to lose a child. And a lot of the time, um, when you have abortions that occur, uh, it is because of a medical condition uh, in which a mother, a mother's life uh, is either in danger, a child's life would needlessly suffer. Um, and there's just a disgusting amount of just mischaracterization and misdirection of what this is really about on all on on all levels, you know, and I think we need to take a lot of the shame out of the situation um, as well, because honestly, it's it's it is your choice and you should not be shamed uh, for your choice. I have. Uh, you know, publicly kind of talked about my experience uh, with sexual assault in the past. And, you know, after you experience something that traumatizing, if you're a person that menstruates, you know, your cycle, um, and this happened to me, your cycle can be really, really thrown off because of the trauma and the stress of being assaulted, um, you may miss a cycle. You may not even be pregnant and you may miss a cycle because of the immense amount of trauma and stress of um, experiencing that. And, um, you know, I remember uh, when that happened, the horror that I had felt um, and I felt really alone and, you know, for context, I grew up in a very religious household. Um, I, I was raised, you know, my dad's side was Catholic. My mom's side was like Pentecostal and evangelical and, um, you know, and that is why these choices are very deeply personal and that's why it is a choice. Um, for every person. But I remember in the moment after what happened, um, I was just so horrified. And what I do remember in that moment was that um, I had felt like no matter what had happened, uh, I at least had a choice in what happened to my life after a choice was taken away from me, um, after a choice over my body was taken away from me, um, it's, it's so traumatizing when something like that happens, but I at least felt so much gratitude um, in that time of uncertainty that even though I didn't know what had happened, um, or what was going to happen, I at least felt like I could have had a choice in, in what would happen moving forward. And whether my values and whether my, my personal um, perspective led me to carry a pregnancy or not is no one else's business but my own. And it could have been my choice and whether it was my religious values or not led me to what you know whatever that may be that's the point is that your future and your life can belong to you and um it is not anybody's no person no man no person can take your body can ethically take your body with and use it how they want without your consent.
whether, and, and that is exactly what Republicans are doing right now. They are taking women's bodies and forcing them, forcing themselves upon women's bodies, forcing their opinions, forcing their perspective on women's bodies without their consent. They are violating not just women, but trans people and non-binary people in this country. So all these people, they're, they, these, I'm sorry, it's, it's, I have a lot of, um, I'm really trying not to curse right now. <laughs> but they are forcing themselves on our bodies without our consent. And they are trying to legislate that in the law. And that is what, that is honestly the similarity between rape culture and these horrifying anti-choice forced birth laws. Direct through line, direct through line. And I, you know, it, it is a part of that um, manipulation. And so I just think that it's incredibly important um, that we stand there in solidarity with people, in solidarity with their ability to have a choice. You know, people say, oh, you know, I'm, sometimes I think even people misconstrue the conversation. They say, I'm pro-life, but I support, I don't wanna tell women what to do. Then you're pro-choice, and you know what decision you would make for yourself, and you know what decision you'd make for your family, but ultimately you're pro-choice. And that's what this is about. But, you know, this fight, it's not stopping here. Um, and I think that what the path forward looks like uh, is going to be, a, it, it's a difficult road. Um, and it's really going to take a lot of inside, outside organizing. Um, I try to be honest with you all. Um, and I want to be honest with you all in terms of, you know, what I think is best in a certain moment. And sometimes the best thing we can do is inside work. And sometimes the effective thing that we can do in out is outside work. Of course, with that, I mean, like kind of inside politics, outside, well, inside electoral politics, outside electoral politics. There's some things that we absolutely can do on inside um, electoral politics, you know. It is shocking to me that the, frankly, the Democratic establishment continues to support members in the Democratic Party who do not believe in a woman's right to choose or a person's right to choose. Um, but we need to, whether you're a Republican or whether you're a Democrat, um, if you believe in taking women's choice away from them, you gotta go. That's just what it is. And so uh, I think this coming Tuesday, um, the 24th, Jessica Cisneros is out in Texas and she is challenging one of the last uh, anti-choice Democrats in the House. Uh, so if you're out in Laredo, if you're out in San Antonio, um, if you're out um, there, please vote for Jessica. Get your butts out to the polls and, and we got to make sure that we that we get that one right because both parties have people who are complicit in this. Let me be very crystal clear about that. And um, we can't just, I'm not just here just to point at Republicans when our own party is protecting people who, who believe in taking my rights away, who believe in taking your rights away, who believe in taking someone who you love's rights away. So we're here, period. And if you don't live near Laredo or San Antonio, um, if you live nearby there, sign up for a canvassing shift and, um, and knock on some doors, talk to some people. If you have cousins or tias or tios out there, hit them up, tell them to vote for Jessica um, and make sure that we, that, that we really give her the dub on, uh, on Tuesday. It's critically important um, because this, we can't just be allowing for this nonsense anymore. I don't know why we started giving a pass to people who believe in taking people's biological rights away. Uh, but I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not about to do that. 
Um, and I don't think that you should do that uh, either. But that's just my case. Um, so that, but that's the electoral part, you know? But I do think that on the, on the flip side of things, a lot of the urgency that we have right now, what happens after Tuesday with Jessica, is that we have a lot of outside organizing that we need to do. Um, we need to be putting our resources, whether it's our time or our skill, or maybe you have an extra room in your house, to directly aiding people who need abortions uh, because their right to care is under attack. And that means we're gonna have to help where that means we're going to have to help um, hourly wage workers not just help fund their bus ticket to come out, but they're going to lose shifts. You know, it's it, you're going to lose like days of work and you shouldn't be able to, you know, have to choose between getting evicted and and, you know, having control over your body. And so um I think it's extremely, extremely important that we we have to start organizing. And what we what that means is creating networks. That means um, donating directly to abortion funds. That you know, frankly, you know, I think we have a lot of advocacy growing up, going. That's really wonderful. And those advocacy efforts, if that is like where your heart and soul is, you know, by all means, go there. Um, but I think what we really need right now is a lot of infrastructure and in direct support um, and support that's and, you know, that's one thing that abortion funds do, uh, which is why I've got it pinned here. If you got a couple bucks, toss it their way. If not, totally cool. Um, but, you know, we all have something to give. And so whether it's an extra couch uh, for someone to stay so that they don't also need to pay for a hotel uh, in a different place, whether it's, you know, even connecting somebody, if you know somebody, you know, connecting people who need them with people who can host them, that's the kind of infrastructure that we're going to have to build in the short term uh, in order to be resilient, um, uh, you know, with everything that's going on. But it is just, it's awful of of what everything that we're seeing and we're going to have to build a lot of infrastructure on the outside and inside to fight back on this and i mean this is why when we talk about um what what's going on with abortion as well it's like i mean that's the thing is that no matter what your views are i mean and like you're gonna have to excuse me for a moment because as someone who did grow up in a religious household I just find even even the the religious argument for mandating these laws is just so ridiculous. First of all, this country has a separation of church and state. We do not live to the Republican Party's um, disappointment. We do not live in a Christian theocracy. Okay, we live in a in a multicultural and a multi faith, including those who of no faith. Uh, democracy and we live in a secular nation and that secular uh, democracy must be defended because it is what helps facilitate a safe nation for all who live in it where all are respected and so just as a person would not want to be forced into into receiving an abortion they should not force others into forcing in them into carrying a pregnancy um, and so this is not a Christian theocracy. And for people who say, oh, but you're, you know, you're, you're harming a life. I believe this is life. Well, some religions don't. So how about that? Our Jewish brothers and, and sisters, they are able to have an abortion according to their faith. You know, there are so many faiths that do not have the same definition of life as fundamentalist Christians. And so we, how, what about their rights? What about their right to exercise their faith? It's ridiculous. And it is, it's, it is theocratic. It's authoritarian. It is wrong. It's wrong. And, um, 
you know, again, it's so crazy too, because it's, I, I try not to get into the, the Christian and theocratic arguments, but seriously, as someone who, who grew up um, in, a, in, a, in a Christian household, I've been thinking a lot about the parable of Christ. And if you all would indulge me um, for a moment, um, for those who may not be Christian, those who happen to be Christian or may not be familiar with the story, it's still a story that I think would be in, is, is relevant in general, right? This parable. And the parable is, um, is of a woman a lot of people may have heard the phrase, let he without sin uh, throw the first stone. Let's talk about that story for a second. In that story, there is a woman um, who, uh, and excuse me if I get like some of these small details, a uh, little bit off for generous interpretation, but I'm, I'm, getting the, um, I'm getting the gist of it here for you all. There's a story where there's a woman, right? she was not allowed to be granted a divorce from her husband. Her husband uh, refused to grant her a divorce. And at that time, if that happened, he had control um, and that was that. And so, but for all intents and purposes, they were not really together. Um, and there were also the Pharisees at this time, which were kind of very strong, um, Oh, there were strong religious slash political esque um, leaders. They kind of blurred the lines a little bit between politics and religion. And many of these Pharisees were in a physical relationship with this woman. Now, let's be really clear about the power dynamic here. When you have several powerful people doing this, it frankly really blurs the lines of consent. Because what choice would she really have when these people hold so much power in a time like that, right? And, um, and so at one point, one of the Pharisees is caught with a woman and she is immediately marched out into the, into the town square. And she's marched out before she's even able to get dressed. So they force her outside. She's barely dressed, trying to cover herself. Um, and everyone is starting to surround the woman. And they're trying to figure out, wow, we caught her with one of the Pharisees, how evil, etc. They're trying to figure out what they're gonna do with her. Are we gonna stone her, etc. They're going through all of the options. Of course, the Pharisees is, doesn't really seem to be a subject to any sort of similar treatment um, that she is, even though he was just as complicit. And if anything, he was the one that was abusing power and public trust. Um, and they're all surrounding her, trying to figure out what's uh, going on. And then they say, okay, there's this, um, basically, Christ has, uh, you know, Christ has, has taken interest in what's going on. I call him over. He comes over and everyone starts putting their attention to him on what to do. And he starts drawing in the sand, something in the sand, and people come out and they start to see that he has here written down, let he without sin cast the first stone. He was talking about the Pharisees. He wasn't talking about her. And sometimes people interpret the story as saying, implying that she was a sinner and everyone else is a sinner um, as well. And so sinners can't really judge sinners like everybody just, you know, kind of relax. But really I think there's deeper meaning to that story and um, because he essentially says to her, you know, go forth. And he doesn't condemn her. The people 
that did something wrong there were those who were abusing their power. There are a lot of Pharisees, those, those kinds of types running around today, trying to abuse women, trying to take their autonomy away. And um, all in the name of a book that they haven't really studied that closely. I believe in a separation of church and state. I believe that my faith, whether I have it or not, has nothing to do with my public service because we have a secular democracy. And for someone who says, go forth and sin no more, do you think he was, that I see that there's a comment here saying, oh, he was talking to her, was he? Was he? It's commonly interpreted. But read it again. Read it again. We have a secular democracy for a reason. Because having our democracy be secular is what helps us be a democracy. If it's not secular, it's a theocracy. And it allows for just all sorts of horrifying human rights abuses, which is what this is. So, you know, and people say, um, you know, and I'm hearing, I'm seeing some comments and like, I wanna make sure that I'm being interactive and stuff like that. I don't wanna ignore everything, but you know, someone says, you know, I like you, but I do believe that the way we believe in things like religion affect our service to others. You know, I, I agree in that my faith has shaped my sense of morality. It has shaped um, my identity and my upbringing, but I do not impose my faith on others. And, um, or not, you know, I can't, if, if, I were, if I were an atheist, I can't force people to not practice their faith. I, mean, I can't impose these things on other people. And that's why our democracy is so important. Um, because what I can do is that while they, that may shape, you know, m some of my perspectives, it doesn't allow me to impose those perspectives on others. And so, you know, I, I just think that right now is a time um, that's just really, really important for us to stand with each other. And by the way, like honestly, even like taking all of religion about uh, out of this, this is a small d democracy issue. The vast, vast majority of Americans, whether they are, whether they are secular, whether they adhere to a faith, whatever it, whatever it is, the vast majority of Americans believe in a person's right to choose. They believe in a person's right to choose. So I just think it's, um, it's incredibly important right now. We have a long fight ahead of us. We have a very real fascist threat in the United States. Um, and that is also that through line with uh, the horrifying massacre in Buffalo. Uh, I think it's really important that we recognize that we're moving away from a period of thinking or seeing as these shootings as, as kind of random tragedies and really acknowledging that the fascist white supremacist movement in the United States is building a war infrastructure. Um, and I don't say that lightly, I don't take that lightly, but you, you just need to look around they are creating their own propaganda. They have successfully uh, transmitted that propaganda very broadly on television, on the internet, using algorithms, et cetera. Um, they have, there, has, there was a, 
a goddamn insurrection on the capital of the United States led by white supremacists. Seven people died. They tried to interrupt the peaceful transition of power in the United States. And it was just a test run. We need to really understand the severity of what is happening right now. Um, what happened in Buffalo was a person who was a part of that movement. This is not about mental illness. We're not, we are beyond that. We are well, well, well beyond that. These are people who are citing their direct influences. They are citing their political goals. They are articulating very clearly what their motivations are. They have a defined and very well articulated worldview that is white supremacist and fascist in nature. They have a theory of change. They do not believe in democracy. They believe in violence in order to attain their political ends because, because they are not a majority. And the only way truly that they see a path to power is through the violent is through violence and subjugation of people who are not like them not only in identity but also in belief these are not random incidents they are part of a plan it is an unfolding of a movement we know this this is not crazy conspiracy stuff it's not you, you see the way that they've organized, whether it's Proud Boys or whether it, you know, all of these different factions that showed up. Just look at, at what happened on January 6th. They all, sh they all showed up in flags um, and uh, they all showed up with flags and with names and this, that, and the other. This is not about mental illness. And we're not gonna stigmatize people with mental illness. By, by doing that. We're not gonna do that. Nope. Because I know plenty of people who have even had mental crises uh, or have struggled in their mental illness, they're, when, you know, when they have a crisis or when they have an issue, their motivation isn't to go out and racially target black and brown people for murder. That's not mental illness, that's white supremacy. And um, I just think that it is, it, it, we have to understand that we have crossed a threshold and this is organized. This is organized. He cites Tucker, these people have cited Tucker Carlson, they cited Ben Shapiro, they cited Candace Owens as justification for their murders. I'm tired of this equating, oh, the left and the right are just as violent. No, they're not. The vast majority of domestic terrorism in the United States is funded by white supremacist organizations. When Donald Trump became president, one of the first things that he did was cut funding to, to white supremacy de-radicalization programs. That was one of the early things that he did. We saw what happened in New Zealand with the shooting. They're citing right-wing propagandists as justification for their murder. This is infrastructure. You have information, you have propaganda, you have arms, you have organizing, and these are efforts that are being funded. They're being funded by billionaires. They're being funded by oligarchs. They're being funded by networks like the Koch brothers and the Mercers. They've got money, they've got weapons, they've got propaganda, they've got, th this is an organized effort. They've got lawyers, they've got Ted Cruz and, and PowerPoints about how they're gonna overturn United, United States democracy. This is, what we, this is what is happening right now. 
And we have to open our eyes and recognize that, you know, the American exceptionalism into thinking that our democracy here is like, is, is infallible is wrong. We're not infallible. And we have a responsibility to protect each other, to protect our democracy, to protect our rights. Um, and, uh, and to really recognize difficult truths for what they are. So um, anyways, um, I just wanted to kind of um, put that out there. I also um, think it's, it's really important for us to have eyes on what happened with uh, Shireen Abu Akhle in, in Palestine. You know, she was killed by Israeli forces, um, a venerated journalist, a U.S. citizen. Um, and, you know, we, we can't allow, we just, we can't allow the, this, this stuff to be happening on our, with our resources, you know, like a lot of times people say, oh, you know, a lot of times people say like, oh, like, you're treating this differently and you're, you're, you're picking, you know, you're picking them out and treating them differently. We, we are, our tax dollars are a part of this. Our resources are a part of this. We can't even get health care in the United States and we're funding this. There has to be some sort of line that we draw. It has to stop at some point. Um, and it's just, it, you know, if you're like me and you come up uh, in a family or a background uh, where these issues weren't really predominant, um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be that complicated. And a lot of times people try to make it seem like you don't understand what's going on or they try to make it seem as though, you know, believing that Palestinians are human beings that deserve human rights is like somehow inherently anti-Semitic. It's not. And it's insulting, um, I believe, to the actual profound amount of anti-Semitism that our Jewish brothers and sisters are, are confronting right now. Because it's not a joke. We're seeing hate crimes against Jewish people in our in New York City, we're seeing, you know, explode in the last couple years. And we can't be, we can't be confusing terms like this. We need to be really careful. Um, and it's just, you know, it, it just can't be the case that anything can happen. You know, that U.S. resources help, help, I mean, like we saw an entire media building get bombed last year. That can't be happening in like with our consent, with us looking away anymore. And that doesn't mean that you don't believe in, it, you know, in, in Israeli people being safe, but I mean, we can't believe in Palestinians being safe too. This is out of control. Um, and, you know, I. I I just want to thank so many folks because this is such a difficult issue. Um, and it's a difficult issue in so many different ways. It's, it's traumatic to some folks. There's so much that, so many people that come uh, to this with trauma. Um, and then of course, it's, there's just a lot that's just kind of swept under the rug. It's like always been this political kind of no-go zone um, for all parties for so long that you're not allowed to talk about it. Uh, to the point that then people don't know about it. And um, it's just, we, there has to be a line here. Um, and I think uh, it's just really important because when people say, you know, why is this any of your business? It's our business because our resources are going to it. Just like last year when it was going on with Colombia, it was U.S. resources that were helping 
fund some of that paramilitary that was cracking down on labor, uh, on, on the labor uprising. And what did I do? I introduced legislation to cut that out so that U.S. resources were, weren't going towards suppressing labor movements and violence against people in Colombia. You know, we're, this, is, this is a principle. This is not something that we should be able to do, even when it's politically difficult. We, I mean, this, it really should be so basic. And it's really kind of boggled my mind. It's really, frankly, shocked me how much um, some people's rights, basic human rights, are like, like they're just like politically too controversial to believe in. I don't believe in kids in cages here and I don't believe them there. I don't believe them anywhere. I don't believe in US funding, supporting state violence here in Colombia or anywhere else. That's not where our, that's not where our resources should be going to. Um, especially when we don't even have the basic things that we need here, especially when people can't afford a house, people can't afford health care. Um, we need to set the crooked path straight. Um, anyways, um, so there's that. <laughs> Vote for Jessica on Tuesday. Um, and... Um, yeah, I had some happy news uh, as well, despite all of that. Um, I got, um, I was engaged, I, I got engaged, so I'm very um, happy to share that news. And, um, um, but, you know, that's just something that, you know, these are just some thoughts and I'm happy to see if I can answer some questions, take a look at what you're talking about. Um, someone says, I must work with a vocal coach. Um, I mean, first of all, my voice is how it's going to, my voice is sound how it's going to sound. However, I could use some help when I go out to rallies, not losing my voice every time. So, <laughs> so I could work with a vocal coach, but not to coach me out of, you know, just because people don't like how women sound or how young women sound. I'm not going to try to not sound like who I am, but I do agree that I need to protect my voice. Um, <laughs> um, let me see if there's any other questions here that I can um, take a look at. Um, let's see. Someone said, um, should we give up hope on student loan forgiveness? Absolutely not. I mean, y'all. The we just had a major extension put in, and I really do believe. I real. I would not tell you if I didn't believe otherwise. I'm not here to guarantee you any outcomes, but I have spoken with the president about this, and I really do believe that they are feeling. They're they're feeling, and they're they're feeling where people are at, um, and. I think that, you know, what they decide to do with that, uh, we don't know, but I, I don't think you should give up on, um, on student loan forgiveness. I think that one of the reasons that we're seeing the moratorium be extended is because there are a lot of folks trying to figure out what they do what, and, and how we're going to approach this because I think they've realized that, um, that, you know, we really can't do nothing about this. So, um, so we've got that. Um, let me see what else. Um, what do I think about um, the Dem PA candidate? You know, I think it was definitely the best outcome that Pennsylvanians could have made in the primary. So congratulations to John, uh, to, uh, to Fetterman. And uh, let's go make sure that he wins in November because uh, we can't be having a, a Republican win that seat. That's for sure. Um, Let's see. Um, let's see. Someone says, 
uh, do you think Dems have a chance in the midterm? I think we might. I think we might have a chance in the midterm if we continue to nominate badass people like Summer Lee with her victory, um, as well as the sweep uh, of many other progressive candidates that won. And the reason why is because these people are actually exciting. <laughs> Summer Lee excites me. She's the kind of person that makes that makes people want to vote, you know? Um, and, and there's so many other candidates like that that kind of beat out the traditional kind of old school, big money, democratic candidate that usually wins in these races. They usually have the thumb pressed on their scale, on the scale for them. And they beat them. And they, they beat them while being outspent, while being outspent. So, um, Someone says, does the shirt say abolish ICE? Yes, it does. Um, uh, th this was um, made by uh, local artists from our community. We have them up. They're actually, they're um, campaign gear. Um, but um, yeah, we, we do collaborations. And then um, in the immediate uh, aftermath of some of the collabs, we also, uh, the proceeds go to relevant um, community organizations. So. Um, but anyways, um, yeah, so, you know, I think it's, it's, all this stuff is super important. Let me see what other questions y'all have. Oh, uh, some people have brought up Puerto Rico. Today I introduced, uh, today we unveiled uh, self-determination, um, or rather a, a, a process by which um, people in Puerto Rico could actually have uh, free and fair elections to determine status. And it's real. It's very important and quite historic. The first reason why this is historic, it's the first time the United States will have acknowledged that its arrangement with Puerto Rico is colonial in nature. Uh, for a very long time, it has defended this as a legitimate arrangement. And it's the first, and this would be the first time that the United States would acknowledge um, that it is in fact a overseeing a colonizing and a, col a colonial relationship with Puerto Rico. Secondly, it is, a, it is the first time that it will have authorized a binding status election so that the outcome of such election uh, would require, essentially, uh, the United States to adhere to the will of people on Puerto Rico. The third reason that this is historic is that when it comes to past plebiscites on the island, sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, well, you know, it had this outcome or that and the other, but um, there've been a lot of challenges to the legitimacy of those prior elections um, because of the way that the ballots are, the ballot question is presented, um, the facilitation of it, et cetera. And so what this bill does is that it provides three, uh, it, it actually outlines three different status options. The first is, or, you know, I, I won't say what order they're in, but you have statehood, you have uh, sovereign free association, and you have full independence. Sovereign free association is that Puerto Rico will become a sovereign uh, state that is in treaty with the United States. An example of this uh, would, be the, um, would be the nation of Palau, uh, which was a former U.S. colony that actually uh, achieved independence in 1994 and entered a 50-year compact with the United States so people in Palau uh, can uh, join the Affordable Care Act, um, they can attend U.S. educational institutions, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and, uh, the, and people of Puerto Rico would be born uh, and have U.S. citizenship for the duration of that first compact, um, but it would be a sovereign state. Um, and so that is uh, one of the things that, you know, that's, that was unveiled today and it's currently a discussion draft. Um, and we are gonna be going to Puerto Rico uh, in order to receive uh, grassroots and just everyday people's input on the draft of that legislation. So it's not just a couple members of Congress unveiling it and us going to a vote, but it needs to have uh, the feedback of um, the people of Puerto Rico on that. So um, there's that. Um, and let me see what other questions there are here. 
Um, but um, just seeing what else is in here. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm not able to see all of the comments. They, they, they go so quickly. Um, but what is the best outcome uh, for Ukraine without the most collateral damage in the world? I mean, I think Russia needs to get out. Um, that, that will reduce the collateral damage, I think. Um, the longer it's there, the longer it really negatively impacts, of course, not just Ukrainians, but um, it negatively impacts just has a lot of knock-on effects on geopolitical power. So um, now, <laughs> certainly a lot easier said than done. Um, but I think that um, self-determination and sovereignty is is right, and we cannot allow um, we can't allow that to be upended. Um, let's see. Just taking a look at any other things. Um, just sorry, it's like all, all the comments happen so quickly. So I'm trying to pop up here, see what y'all got. Um, Do you think that with what is happening in our society, is this the things get worse before they get better? I do. Um, I think that one of the things one of the things that we see here is, you know, a lot of this is a result of a historical neglect of the United States to deal with um, our historic wounds. Um, and that is not just in terms of a woo-woo or emotional sense, but there's a really direct through line between, uh, between how the United States handled Reconstruction after the Civil War to today. We just wanted to brush all this under the, sh under the rug, and those tensions that the United States failed to deal with in the late 1800s are haunting us today. And that's why I think even to today, some of the most quote unquote divisive issues ha do center on race um, and also, you know, gender, etc. cetera. But um, it's because we never really healed that wound in the first place. And we allowed things like the lost cause to flourish um, and all of that. And this is going to continue to come up until we actually get to a place where we heal um, for real. Um, let's see. Thank you everyone for the congratulations. Um, why is the Democratic Party slow to respond to the behavior of the opposite party? I think it's, I think, I think it's because a lot of our institutions are designed to electorally favor um, minority rule by the Republican Party. Um, because you look at the Electoral College with the presidency, you look at the Senate, and you look at gerrymandering in the House, and that means that all three of our institutions are designed in a way um, to amplify um, uh, minority power. And the House is our strongest institution against that, but it's still subject to gerrymandering. Um, and so I think one of the reasons why it's difficult is because there's just a lot more, I think, um, let's say this, there's a lot more conservative Democrats than there are liberal Republicans. <laughs> So I'll say that that's the problem in a nutshell. <laughs> um, this is not gerrymandered in a way where like the amount of liberal Republicans is equal to the amount of conservative Democrats. Um, you know, there are pro-abortion Democrats. I mean, there, there are anti-choice 
Democrats, I don't really know of too many pro-abortion or, or pro-choice uh, Republicans in the House, I, at least in the House. You know, I'll, I will um, say that. There, there are one to two female senators uh, that are Republican that believed in um, Roe v. Wade, allegedly, even though they supported people who clearly were going to overturn. Um, so I, you know, they say that they support it. I don't see how their votes are very consistent with that. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, someone said, AOC, you're such a radical on everything, most of which um, aren't backed by anything but personal opinion. Like, really, am I that radical? Is it like, that's the thing that's so crazy. It's like, you wanna know the, the power of propaganda? The power of propaganda is that we believe that thinking everyone should have health care is a radical leftist pos uh, position. That's the power of propaganda, that we believe that, you know, having the right to a union and that, hmm, maybe if you're a billionaire of a company, maybe the, the workers who create the billions of dollars that you enjoy, maybe they shouldn't have to sleep in a car. Maybe they should afford, uh, you know, to be able to live in an apartment. Radical me, right? Maybe um, police shouldn't be able to kill people with impunity. Radical me, right? Maybe our tax dollars should go to childcare than caging kids. Radical me. And it does get to a point where people may say, oh, you know, these are such minority fringe positions, but I told myself a very long time ago that I, first of all, never thought that I would be in electoral politics because I never thought someone like me could get elected, someone who doesn't come from a wealthy family, someone who doesn't come from a powerful connected group of people, you know, someone who's a daughter of, of, of a house cleaner. I never thought someone like me could get elected. And even if someone like me could, like in terms of identity could get elected, I thought that I would have to abandon all of my convictions and beliefs. For a very long time, I didn't know if I was part of either political party because I couldn't see who actually represented me in government, the views that I had. And I would see both parties authorize tax breaks, both parties authorize the colonial status of where my family's from, both parties, um, you know, being buddy buddy with Wall Street. And I just felt like I didn't even think I was left or right. I just thought that like there was just no place for me. And so, yeah, maybe people think that my views are super radical, left-wing, marginal, or whatever, um, because I don't think that kids should be in cages. I think everyone deserves health care. I think housing is, is a right. I don't think that um, that huge major Wall Street companies should be able to gobble up homes and then working class people can't afford them. Radical me. I also thought that I was maybe very marginal or fringe, turns out there's enough people who agree with me that elected me to Congress. And not just elected me to Congress, but I didn't have to take a dime of corporate money, I didn't have to take a dime of lobbyist money, but that I was funded by people with an average donation of, it was something like maybe, my first election, my average donation was like, I don't know, 17 or $19 a piece. Um, and so, you know, we can take that, you can take that to the test. Maybe I'm so fringe and I'm so this, that, and the other, but there's enough people who agree with me that um, gave me the blessing of becoming the youngest woman ever elected to the United States Congress. And I'm, you know what? I will flex on that because it's not me who did it. It was you who did it. It was everyday people who did it, who wanted to see that those views represented. I happen to represent them now, but I also have faith that even if it wasn't me, someone would, someone would, and others are. And as we're seeing with the elections of more people like Summer Lee, like hopefully Jessica Cisneros, which regardless of the outcome, she drove a 20 year incumbent into a runoff. So 
to me, that tells me not only did I was I elected, but we've only grown and grown and grown since then. Because they sent Ayanna Presley, they sent Jamal Bowman, they sent they 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 sent Jessica Cisneros to a runoff. They're now sending Summer Lee. So maybe we're not as fringe as people like to tell you we are. And maybe that's part of the propaganda there too. Because when you actually look at it, the vast majority of people think that they should be able to afford their insulin and not have to choose between medicine and rent. That know that they should be able to be paid a dignified wage. And that maybe um, having some of the worst income inequality in American history, maybe there's a little something wrong that's going on. And maybe the status quo and what is normal is not actually that normal after all. And actually isn't that okay after all. And maybe some communities have started to take that into their own hands and send people to Congress that represent them and not just elect whoever spent the most money in a campaign. So anyways, much love to you all. Thank you so, so, so much. Um, I so appreciate all of you all joining. Um, and let's move on. Bye-bye.